Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Jim Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I know you just sat down. So I'm going to let you stay seated while I pray. Is that okay? I'm going to take my jacket off. Thanks, Carrie. And let's go before the Lord. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus. We give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in this house this day. We haven't come to hear from a man. We have come to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us. Direct us, motivate us to be all that you would have us to do and be. And God will give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father. We ask you to bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our brothers and our sisters, if they're preaching Jesus, we love them and support them. We thank you, Father, for that. This is the most discouraging day in the heart of pastors all year long because after the high of Easter, people don't come back to church the next week. But we thank you, God, that you're going to bless those men and women of God that are faithful, encourage their hearts. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. Before I read you the scripture, I've got a monumental statement to make to you. We're going to Hebrews, the 10th chapter. <laughs> oh, listen to you. Shut up. Actually, Hebrews, the ninth chapter was really kind of cool because Hebrews, the ninth chapter really set us up for a phenomenal Easter. I mean, this platform was amazing in itself. We decided to keep it up for a little bit until Monday. When Monday comes, you know, the whole platform changes, and I don't know what they have in mind for the platform. Maybe some big giant gorilla eating a dog or something. I don't know. <laughs> Men are kind of weird when they get together, you know, beating up a car or whatever. But anyway, we're just excited about Easter. Easter was really meaningful to all of us because of chapter 9 of Hebrews that set us up for Easter. That was a, a work of the Holy Spirit. And before I give you a title, before I mention anything, I, I want to get your attention. I want to talk to you about something. The other day I was listening to the radio, and this intellect was on the radio, certainly a secular commentary made about Christianity that really frustrated me at first, and then the Spirit of God spoke to me and asked me to explain it to you. He made a statement. He says, Christianity has got to be like the craziest religion in the world. He says, can you believe there are people that follow a fable and people who are mindless in their religion? And I stopped and I thought about it for a moment on what he had to say. Being a follower of Jesus Christ is one of the most difficult things you will ever do in your walk. Because a disciplined follower, and that's what the word disciple means, it means that you're not just doing something for a short period of time, but you're going to be doing something for the rest of your life and eternity. And like we so celebrate our physicians, and we thank God for doctors who are highly educated. Yesterday morning had a couple of physicists on the front row that were listening, and I'm highly uh, uh, impressed with their education. You stop for a moment, and you think about what's intelligent and what isn't. There are people who can study for Tuesday's test. They can cram and get a decent grade, eventually get a degree. And we celebrate that and we thank you as that has been intelligent of people to do. But this is not about cramming and learning just so you could take a test on Tuesday. This is about a dis disciplined follower of things of God with your body, soul, and spirit and your mind. It doesn't last until Tuesday and you forget about it. 
It lasts forever. As you are learning how to be what God has called you to be, it is the most difficult. And only those that have a heart for the things of God can ever complete the task. So when someone says, you know, where high education comes to a conclusion based on the data that it was given to it, and then we find ourselves in a place of realizing that the highest education you could have is that which comes from truth. It's so high to you that you discipline your life to follow it all the days of your life. You are anything but a mindless religion. And the very fact that some secular person calls us a mindless religion, he does not understand what goes in to be a disciplined learner and follower of the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. And for all of us, we need to make some decisions. And when we come into the house of God, we not only let the Spirit of God touch us, but we come into the house of God to learn what the Word of God has to say so that we can follow God His way. In fact, the title of this message is When Approaching God. Out of the 10th chapter of Hebrews, you are going to approach God one way or the other. How many people approach God the wrong way, get the wrong results? And can I ask you a question? Where does it say you can approach God your way? Where does it say you have the right to come to God your way and God will submit to your way? If that was the case, then it would be a free for all. And it's not. When you come to God, you better come to God God's way because if you don't come God's way, then he becomes a follower of you instead of you becoming a follower of him. Are you following me? <laughs> Hebrews, the 10th chapter, makes a statement that's obvious. We understand this from because of the 9th chapter. It goes on in verse number one to say, for the law having a shadow of good things to come. We understood that as the Old Testament law was only a shadow of something that was better that was coming along. So we're learning something. The Old Testament, we're going to find out, as we already know, that the Old Testament laws and the procedures and the rituals and the ceremonies, and if you will, and the temple expressions and the offerings and sacrifices were only a shadow of something better to come. And the thing that's better to come is Jesus Christ, of course. He says, he says and not the very image of the things can never the shadow can never change anything. What is just a shadow never changes. If we were standing next to each other and my shadow touched you, the shadow would not move you. Until I moved my weight over there and pushed you, then there would be difference between my shadow touching you and not. And he's saying the shadow can never do it. And op watch this, watch this, listen to me now. Oftentimes we Christians live and operate in a shadow instead of the real. And it will never get us to where we need to be because we're operating and living in something that is a shadow of it, but not the real of it. It says these sacrifices which are offered continuously year by year will make uh, those, who, I love these words, who approach perfect. And they can't do it. They can't make those who approach God. The word approach is an interesting word. In the old King James, the word is come. Those that come to God. In other words, you can approach God your way, and you can approach God my way, and we can approach God their way. We can approach God some committee's way, but there is a right way to approach God. Amen. Are you following me? And those who come to God uh, approach, it, the, the Old Testament expressions of the high priest sacrifice could never do it. It was just a shadow and could never make you perfect. Then it goes on in verse number two and it makes this statement, which is interesting. It says, for, for would they have not ceased to be offered? In other words, if you were made perfect, they would have stopped. It didn't do that. 
For the worshiper, once purified, in other words, made perfect, watch this, would have no more consciousness of sin. And they have no more idea about living in something they don't need to live in. Oftentimes, you and I will keep on living in our past when we're washed by the blood today. And therefore, my, my goodness, when you come to God, you are out of sync with what you should be doing. Instead of approaching God the right way, you're approaching God the wrong way because you're still stuck in your sin and how bad you were. Which brings us to number three. Verse number three says, but these sacrifices are a reminder of sin every year. In other words, they had them, they do them all the time. It was a reminder of where they were at. So they never saw themselves as clean. They never saw themselves as perfect. They never saw themselves made right. They always saw themselves as sinners and they live like sinners that way. Which brings us to number four. In verse four, it says this, for it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats. We understand that to take away sins, and therefore, it had to be Jesus. Now, here's my point. We oftentimes live in a shadow, expecting the shadow to move us, instead of living in the truth, which can move us to where we need to be. If I don't approach God, come to God, the right way. And every day I come to God. Every day I make petitions. Every day I, I, I will say something to God. Every day I'll worship God. Every day I have a connection with God. But if I'm not approaching God the right way, who says that my approach is acceptable to God? Who told you that? See, and it could be the shadow of what's real. And it's very important because some people approach God on a constant basis because they're full of guilt. Is that right? Some people approach God because they're full of sin. Some people approach God because they're full of need. Ever seen the person who's always full of need and they approach God, but they never approach God the right way. And some people approach God because they're full of love. And there is a God way of approaching God and a wrong way of approaching God and a right way. When you do it the right way, you get results. When you do it the wrong way, you don't, have you ever felt like nobody's listening to your prayers? Nobody's listening to your relationship as you come to God? Kind of hits the ceiling and stops, doesn't go to heaven. So today I thought it'd be interesting as the Spirit of God was ministering this to me, not just to tell you about the approach, but show you how to approach God. Here's what I want to say, how to approach our God. Three things God gave me quickly, I want to explain them to you. The number one way to approach God, get this, write it down, it's good for you, is the word in humility. Sometimes we're so caught up in ourselves, self-exaltation, and that's really what the world is looking for, is self-reliance. If you can be self-reliant, can I tell you something? Self-reliance comes from the fall in the garden. Before the fall in the garden, they were never self-reliant, Adam and Eve. They were always reliant, dependent upon God. And true humility is being flexible enough to be dependent upon God. It's that simple. Here's what it says. Uh, everything I'll ever be, everything I'll ever do, every place I'll ever go, whatever I will accomplish, it's all because of God. And you got to get out of the front seat and get in the back seat. In fact, forget about the back seat. A lot of people need to get into the trunk. <laughs> if you're like me, you know what I'm talking about. And that you get to the place where you're going to approach God and realize that God is God. And without God, you've got nothing. In fact, where were you when he hung the stars? Where were you and I when he hung the moon and the, star and the sun? We weren't even around. And all of a sudden, we come to God and we think we are all that. Here's why. Because all we hear about is how much he loves us. Does he love us that much? Yes. But it shouldn't get us into a haunty position. We need to be a people that are humble before God, realizing he is God Almighty. Is anybody listening? I think the worst of that, I hate to over, never use preachers as an example. I think some preachers ought, ought, ought to slap themselves in the face because you hear all the adulation and all pats on the back at the back door and instead of it staying at the back door and going to their head, it goes to the wrong head. It goes to this one instead of that one. 
You can take all the things that people say to you as long as it goes to the right head. It's not this one. It's got to be that one. He's the head. And you got to be dependent on God. And that's humility. You will find that Moses was dependent on God. You'll find that Joseph and David, they were dependent on God. And that's what humility is all about. That God could use them. If you're not being used by God, and it seems like God can't use you, oftentimes because we're approaching God and we don't have this humility working. Someone might say to me, okay, well, how do I get humility? Never pray for it. <laughs> Trust me, you do not want God to hum make you humble. I like this, well, oh God, please make us humble. Let me tell you something, God knows how to knock the stuffing out of you to make you very humble. Don't do that. You want to know how to make yourself humble? Watch these words. So simple, all through Scripture, it makes it very clear. Uh, Matthew, the 18th chapter, verse number 4, just pop it up on the overhead. Therefore, whoever humbles himself, if you know you need humility, then therefore you're the one that's going to have to push yourself into a humble position and start to see yourself in a humble position. Whatever you accomplish in business, whatever you accomplish in life, whatever adulations the world pat you on the back, whatever acceptance and approval of men you get, it all goes to Jesus Christ. You're going to have to realize, and so am I, that we are here to humble ourselves. Just as a little child, he says, is it like one whose grace you ever seen a little child? Now, I'm not talking about teenagers. Thank God he said, like, he didn't say, humble yourself like a teenager. You know, anybody got teenagers you want to just put in a deep freeze? <laughs> or take them out when they're 20? But there's a little child, little child says, Mama, I need food. Mama, I need to, I don't, I, I just went to the bathroom with my pants. Oh, Mama, can I sleep with you? Oh, Dad, can I sleep in your bed? Okay, sleep in my bed. What the heck did you do in my bed? What is this all about? What are you doing, Pastor Luke? <laughs> no, he's not here, so I thought I'd tease him. You know. Don't tell him I said that. <laughs> Humble yourself as a little child. Great verse. James says it like this, if you will. James 4, chapter, verse 10. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humbling yourself is not just to yourself, but it's in the sight of God. God's watching what you're doing in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up, whatever business, whatever family, whatever you need. If you'll take that lower position, let God be in the right position, then all of a sudden you're approaching God the right way. He is what it's all about. Are you listening to what I'm saying? I like what it says in, in Micah, the sixth chapter, verse number eight. Micah, the sixth chapter, verse number eight. He has shown to you, O oh man, what is good. And, and I love this. And what the Lord requires. Oftentimes we ask God, God, what do you want from me? Well, God now tells you what he wants from you. He wants three things from you. Fascinating things. Watch this. That you do justly. See the word justly? When you come to a place in your walk, watch this, watch this. Humility takes the back seat to your own feelings your own wants. If humility takes the back seat to your own feelings, have you ever said to God, it's not fair? Have you ever thought to yourself, that's not fair? Can I tell you something? If God says it's fair, even though it's not fair in your calculations, it's fair. And that's what it means, just. So what God says, what his will is, how it works, do it. That's called justly. The second thing he asked for, and I love this, is to love mercy. In other words, be somebody who's going to extend something to someone else who doesn't deserve it. That's mercy, and that's what he does with us. But the third thing that he requires of us, it's really fascinating, it says walk humbly with your God. Didn't say, you see, Adam and Eve walked humbly before the fall with God. Then they got out of that humble position, got into them self position, and partook of the fruit that the tree of knowledge of good and of evil, and failed, and sin came into mankind. 
But before that, they walked in the garden humbly with the Lord. Humbly means just simply dependent on God. And so you're going to walk out, live out life, dependent on God for everything that you have. That's the three things he requires of you and I. First thing we do when we approach God is we've got to acknowledge who we are. He is great. He is wonderful. And Lord, I'm dependent on you. Second thing we're talking about is this and how to approach God is in faith. You're going to approach God believing God, trusting in God, having confidence in God. But faith is a funny word. The faith that I'm talking about when you approach God is like a two-sided coin. On one side, it's faith and confidence in God. On the other side, which is really a fine line, watch this, a fine line is faith and confidence in who you are in God. Because if you get too big on who you are, then you void out point one, be independent and humble. And we can see ourselves as so righteous that we approach God in our own righteousness instead of the righteousness of God. And we become arrogant about being sons and daughters of the Most High God. And you need to have a confidence in that, but always remember to be humble that he's the one that's in control. And we need to have a people, that's all of us, that realize that faith is very important. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse 6 says it like this. It says that there's no other way to uh, please God but by faith. And he that comes to God, that's approaching God, must believe that he is. He is what? He's God. They must believe that he is God. And this is this, that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's becoming this disciplined disciple with your mind, your soul, and your spirit, following him all the days of your life. Wow. Amazing truth. So when we approach God, we approach God in humility, but we also approach God in confidence and trust in who he is, but also a confidence and trust in who I am in you, but my who I am in you doesn't ever void out. Point one, fine line. Third thing that we see, if you will, in fact, let's go back to point two because I want to give you a verse on that. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse 16, therefore let us come boldly, Confidence and trust in God. Come back boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. So God wants us to approach, to come to God boldly. So humility, faith, and here's the most important. How to approach God. And this is the one that is the most important. Are you ready? In relationship. Yeah. And here's the problem. We all have a different relationship with God. I saw somebody last week as they went by me at the door and I greeted them and they said to their friend, can you believe this? This is amazing. I've been in church two weeks this year already. Or two times this year already. Some people go to church, have a relationship with God two times every day. Three times, four times. But this person, it was a massive relationship because they'd come to church twice this year already. Everybody has a different relationship. And here's the problem with that. What makes you think your relationship with God is acceptable? What makes you think your relationship with God is going to be accepted by God? 
and everybody shouts, Jesus, and by grace. Can I tell you something? When grace, listen to this, listen closely. When grace is used to void out responsibility, then grace is mistaught. And you took a half a truth and made it the whole truth, which was wrong. Let me say it again. When grace is taught as a whole truth, when it's a half a truth, it's mistaught. And if you think that grace will get you past your responsibility, all through the Old Testament and New Testament, God says, be ye holy. It requires it. Doesn't mean it's going to keep you from, it requires it. But what we find oftentimes is we find ourselves operating in a relationship with God based on our feelings, based on what we want, based on how we can do things, instead of based on love. For an example, let me give you a better example. All through the Old Testament, Old Testament, thank God for the Old Testament, those are physical, spiritual truths that become manifested spiritually in the New Testament. And you'll find that whether it be the 70-year captivity of Babylon for Judah, or whether it was a 400-year captivity of Israel in Egyptian uh, Pharaoh's kingdom, you will find that here we find ourselves in a place of realizing those people had a relationship with God. But their relationship with God wasn't based on God, it was based on what they thought. Miriam comes out of a bondage with Egyptians and she's worshiping on the other side with a tambourine and she finds herself worshiping the God that delivered them from Egypt, but it was the wrong God she was delivering the message to. And oftentimes our relationship with God is based on our feelings instead of who he is. Now let me give you an illustration. The Egyptians, their cries went up to God. God heard them. Relationship. The Egyptians, right before, I'm sorry, the Israelites, uh, their cries go to God because of Egyptian bondage. God hears them. Relationship. There's signs and wonders and miracles. The waters turn to blood. The flies are all over. The, if you will, the frogs are in the land. The firstborn of every male in the house of an Egyptian home was killed, but not Israel. Why? Miracles. Then they finally break away from Pharaoh and they're walking to the promised land where God wanted to take them. Man, they are worshiping God. They're praising God. You know why? The Red Sea had just opened up and they walked on, on land. Are you kidding me? The pillars by night was a fire, a flame that kept them warm. Every night a flame was there to keep them warm and every day a cloud covered them from the heat of the sun and then the food fell from from the sky and fed them every single day and the quail walked into their tents and they fed, ate the quail. Are you telling me they didn't have a relationship with God? They built a tabernacle or we would call it a tent temple and there they worshiped God. But guess what happened? Because of their relationship with God, every one of them died off and a new generation takes the promised land. They had a relationship. How many of us have a relationship with God based on us instead of him? And that's the point. Because without the right relationship, we produce the wrong results. And a lot of people don't understand that and don't see that. And it's all about relationship. 
And relationship is a relationship with God that supersedes your feelings. And it's something you do from your heart. Now, because of grace, I don't have to do anything. But because of love, I can hardly wait to do it. And that's called relationship. You understand how that works? I, I'm married to Deborah. I can tell Deborah, Deborah, I, I love you a whole lot. I think you're wonderful. I love you. I love you. I love you, babe. But my job is not just to tell her I love her. My job is to show her I love her. She loves chick movies. And she loves BBC, BB, BBC if you will, the English chick movies. Now, does anybody know about me? You know what I like on television? What is it? Boxing. I'm about as far away from a chick movie as you can possibly imagine. So why do I watch chick movies for her? Because I watch because it's more important that I please her with my love than just tell her I love her. Because when you love someone, you want to please them. So when I say I love God, I can hardly wait. I don't have to go to church. I get to go to church. Wait a minute. I, I don't have to bring my finances, I get to bring my finances. I don't have to walk in holiness. I can hardly wait to develop to holiness. I don't have to walk in mindless, and that's what some of these hyper grace messages, it's a mindless relationship with God based on not his grace, based on our fleshly results, and therefore we don't have to do anything. Can I tell you something? I don't have to do anything. But don't stop there. I have responsibilities. And because I love him, I'll watch the chick flick. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? So watch this, watch this, watch this. Very important for us to see. I want to make this statement to you. I do what I do not to earn. That's the mistake. Let me say it again. I do what I do not to earn something. I do what I do because I love him. And that's relationship. It's not about systematic religious ceremonial rituals unless, and here's where the no judgment comes in, and you can't judge, unless the systematic religion ceremonial rituals are done with a heart of love. Therefore, you can't judge. Is anybody listening? If I do what I do because it's the thing to do, it's religion, and I void out what I do. <laughs> I know, oh, you guys got it on the overhead. Where'd you get that? It should be, if I do what I do to earn something with God, I do what I do because I love him. If I do what I do because it's the thing to do, it's religion, and it voids out what I do. Man, those guys are good. <laughs> do you understand how that works? It's so fascinating. Paul writes that the love of God constrains him. The word constrains means this. It pushes him back up against the wall and I can't go any further. I can't do any more. I'm so in love with him and he's so in love with me. I, 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 I'll, I'll do what he says. The book of 2 Corinthians, in the if you will, just pop it up for me in the fifth chapter, verse 14, says it like this. For the love of Christ, listen to this in the Amplified, controls, urges, and impels us because we are of the opinion and conviction. So it compels us, it controls us, it urges us, the love of God. In other words, I love him so much, I have to do this. Amen. I want to do it. 
I want to grow. I want to live the way he wants me to live. I want to be what he wants me to be. And someone says, well, how do you do that? Here's how you do it. You don't ignore it. You trust in the power of the Holy Ghost on the inside to help you to do it. Number one, and here's how you have a great relationship with God, intimacy. If I didn't hang around Deborah, I wouldn't have an intimate relationship and love with Deborah. I could say, Deborah, I love you, but I'm going to go do my own thing. Deborah, I love you, but I won't be home. Deborah, I'm gone tonight. Deborah, I'm I'm busy. Deborah, I'm working too much. Deborah, I don't have time for you. Deborah, but you know I love you, girl. I love you. No. The more I spend with her in intimacy, the more I fall in love with her. Sometimes. (laughs) I love her and she loves me because we're together as one. But if we weren't close to each other, and it's the same thing with God, you've got to spend time. You won't get it from the History Channel. You won't get it just sitting at home daydreaming. You won't get it. You know, every time and any time you can connect with God is what builds the love of God so that you can trust him for what he says. In other words, listen to this. Love is my responsibility. I do what I do. Every one of us, the Bible says in the first Corinthians, the third chapter, are going to stand before God and your works are going to pass through the fire. Wait a minute. I thought I didn't have to do anything. I'm sorry. Your works are going to pass through the fire. It'll either be gold, silver, or precious stones, which means when the flames hit it, they'll last, or it'll be wood, hay, and stubble, which means when the flames hit it, it'll burn up. If it's from the heart, it's gold, silver, and precious stones. If it's out of some tradition or religion, or I do this because I hate it, but I'm going to do it. Let me tell you something. It'll be flames will hit it and burn it right up. So all of us, this word relation is because God loves us and we love God. We're compelled, controlled, to do it. So when God says something, we say, hallelujah. I'm not there yet, but I'm gonna learn to love you enough to watch the chick flick. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Some of you are gonna walk out of here and say, I wonder where in the Bible it says chick flicks. (laughs) Just hang around a little bit longer, you'll, you'll get it. Three things when you approach God. In humility, in faith, and in relationship, backed by love. I do what I do because I love him. If God spoke to you today, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, let me just talk to some of you. Hey, can I just talk to you before you leave? Everybody sit sit down. Let's talk just for a moment. Some of you, your relationship with God, and you know it, relationship is what we've been talking about. And your relationship with God stinks. And you need to change. And the only way to do that is free will. You're going to have to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It always has been. In John the third chapter, he says these words, you must, I love the word must, don't you? You must be born again. Didn't say try God, didn't say have a mental ascension towards God, or once in a while have a lukewarm relationship with God, you know, you think about him. But he said these words, you must be born again. Born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Listen to this. Here's what born again really means. It means you've been given God all your heart, gave God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus, you heard about the book of Revelation. Jesus says he's coming again, and you know he is. And he says, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Wow, what a crude, rude statement that God just made. I will vomit you from my mouth. My goodness sakes alive. What's he saying? 
What he's really saying is people that call themselves Christians, that are lukewarm, might as well fess up to it. People that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. And they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. And somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. And I love you, honor you, and respect you enough to tell you the truth. Today is your day of salvation. And you're going to have to give God all of your heart. You're going to have to give God all of your life. Guy at the back door recently said these words to me. If God wants my heart and life, he'll take it. No, he won't. He's not a thief. He's not a conniver. He's not a manipulator to make you do this. It's a free will choice, just like loving God, doing what he wants us to do, is a free will choice we make. And today, it's your day of salvation. And some of you have had a lousy relationship with God and you know it. And it's time to get right with God and give him all of your heart, give him all of your life. Be born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. Is that okay? It's the truth. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. Now watch this. I'm a man. I'll see you. He said, if you confess me before men, in a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. You can put it right back down after I see it. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I already know who Jesus is in my head. Now I want him in my heart because you cannot get to heaven with a relationship of knowledge on who he is. It's all about your heart. Have you given him all of your heart? Have you given him all of your life? Remember, it's an all or nothing relationship and you gotta give it to him. And if you haven't done it, somebody needs to love you enough and respect you enough, tell you the truth, you're not gonna make it. And today is your day of salvation. All across this auditorium, if you're one of those people, when you hear the hands pop, bang, you're saying to yourself, I'm running from God instead of to God. I've never given God all my heart. I've never given God all my life. I'm one of those people who are not sure. Make sure today is your day. Today is your day of salvation. Then get ready to put your hand up, put it right back down. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh, you might be, but it's better to be embarrassed for a moment in this safe place than to be in hell forever and ever, ever and ever. Today is your day of salvation. I'm gonna count to three, pop my hands together. Today, you get your hand up, let me see it, put it right back down. Couldn't get any easier. Couldn't get any easier. The question is, will you do it? Do you love him enough to give him all of your heart and give him all of your life? That's what this is all about. Come on, are, are you going to just stick with the side that says you're a mindless religion and you can't join? Let me tell you something, or anything but a mindless religion. Today is your day. Are you ready? I'm counting to three. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one. There's two. Go ahead, sit down. There's three. There's four. Thank you. There's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Thank you. There's 11 back here. There's 12 back here. 13. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? 13. Back in the family room. That family room's full. Somebody check that family room for me. This family room's half full. 13, 14, 15, 16. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. I see up on top. 17. God bless you. 18. Thank you. If there's 18, where are you? 19. Thank you. God bless you. I see there's 19. If there's 19, can you just feel 20? Just get your hand up if you're 20 and let me see it. Raise it high enough that I can see it. Is that okay? Don't be embarrassed. Raise it high enough. Where are you, 20? Where are you, 20? Oh, there's two. 20, 21. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 22 people. Glory to God. All of you now, all 21 or 22 of you, if you're serious about God, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. Is that okay? Nobody leaves during this period of time. That's rude. The Holy Spirit's moving. That's rude. And I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. Get in the aisle. 
nudge your friend, say, come on, I'll go with you if you need to go. If you're sitting next to somebody, give them the elbow and say, come on, I'll go with you. And I want you to get out of your seat. If you're serious about God, you raise your hand from the family and bring your children. They're very welcome. You come. I want you to get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on. have come. I want you all over here in the front row. Thank God you've come. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. I want you to look to your left. See this guy waving at you? His name is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really good, cool, wonderful guy. No weird stuff goes on. Let me tell you what he's going to do. He's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. He's going to give you some free stuff. Free. that will tell you what to do next. Then he'll introduce you to a program we have to help you get strong in Jesus. Why? So you don't go back serving the devil, but you go on in the victory of Jesus. Win in battles of life, and at the end of your life, man, you'll be successful if you, if you sincerely go after God with all of your heart. Remember, this is about relationship. You can have a once in a while mental relationship, or you can have a wholehearted relationship. Big difference, and today you're starting the wholehearted relationship. Don't give flip what anybody else thinks. Doesn't it? We're not a mindless group of people following fables. We got God on our side, and he'll do great, mighty, marvelous things. Make a left turn, follow if you will. Pastor Joel, right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. God good. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.